Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Ping Pong's webinar. My name is William. I'm the BD manager at Ping Pong. Today, we're going to talk about how to optimize your product page for international markets and how to fight fraud when you're going international. As a merchant, uh, such a wonderful topic cannot be accomplished without the help from the amazing partners of Ping Pong's. So let me introduce you to Denise, VP of Partners from ClearStell, and Tani, Head of Partnership from Zonos. So you two want to give us a little bit of introduction about your company and uh, yourself? Sure. I'm Denise Pertzer, and as William mentioned, I run the Partnerships Program here at ClearStell. I've been in e-commerce for about 20 years now, so that dates me a little, but uh, I've uh, been on the payment side, the affiliate side, the partnership side, um, worked with um, a, a, um, a payment solution that was by now pay later, so helped build a business there. So I've seen many facets of e-commerce and, and landed now more recently in the last couple of years in fraud, and I'm loving that space. A uh, little bit about ClearSale. We're a global leader in e-commerce fraud prevention and chargeback protection. We've got almost two decades of experience. We start out in 2001. We're integrated into all of the major e-commerce platforms, and we offer an easy pre-integrated access to our AI-based fraud prevention technology, and we're backed by the world's largest team of in-house fraud specialists. Wonderful, wonderful. How about you, Tani? Yeah, hey, I'm Tani Spanky. Uh, I'm head of partners at Zonos. I have been... Actually, I've been in sales for over 20 years now um, and recently moved over to our partner team. Maybe it's been about a year for that. Uh, a little bit about Zonos, though. We are a SaaS company that we've built technology to help calculate landed cost for online retailers. We have been in business, I think, actually, in September, we hit 11 years. So, um, okay. Yeah, it's great. We're here to help anyone who wants to take their products cross-border. Okay, cool, cool. That's great. We know where to go. So I'll hand it over to you, to Tani, um, and uh, you go ahead and start. And after that is Denise, uh, her section. And we do have Q&A section uh, in the end, um, but folks, feel free to drop questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, we may answer it as we go. And um, so other than that, let's get started whenever you're ready, Tony. Yeah, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Let me pull that up for everyone. I had it all loaded, but for some reason I lost it. That's, that's no problem. <laughs> that happens. That's technology. So basically, Tony going to uh, be talking about um, from stuff from perspective, you know, cross-border and localization. And Denise, obviously, her expertise is in uh, fraud detection. Yeah, so thank you, everyone, for letting me jump on. I am going to talk a little bit about the opportunity that's out there with international and then ways that you can help capitalize on getting your customers the best experience and being able to, you know, grow your business internationally. One of my favorite things I like to talk about is single say. Now, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know what Singles Day is, but it started in China and it was really as kind of an anti-Valentine's Day where it's November, I think it's November 21st, somewhere around there, beginning of November. Um, but they created this day that if you didn't have a loved one and you were single, you could celebrate yourself. Well, it turned in, Alibaba took it and turned it into this big sell day. So most of us here in the U.S. don't know about Singles Day. We think the biggest shopping day is Black Friday or uh, Cyber Monday. But the truth is, is it's actually Singles Day. So these are the numbers from last year. So it, within 24 hours, 30.8 billion cells were done, which was up 27% year over year. They had over 180,000 brands that participated, and this was all online, by the way. And 40% of those sales were from international brands outside of China. Because sometimes we think maybe it was just, you know, China companies who mm -hmm. uh, are able to get those sales. But it's really a great opportunity for countries, 
you know, around the world. Tony, and, uh, yeah. very, very quickly, uh, there is some data saying um, international uh, cross-border e-commerce is outgrowing domestic e-commerce. So how much does that resonate with you? It's absolutely true. Uh, you know, here domestically, we, although we feel really big, there's more customers outside of our country than what we have here in the U.S. So 95% of most buyers are outside the U.S. And that continues to grow year over year. And the opportunity with everything going on, you know, in the world today is a great way for you to build your business up internationally. Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, so uh, Singles Day is out there and it just, to me, it gives a good example of the opportunity that's out there to be able to grow in new markets with it. Uh, kind of talking about, you know, the opportunity as well is that with international e-commerce growing every year, and it is growing faster than it is domestically, one of the things that's happening is that the amount of the market that we have here in the US of international sales continues to decrease. Okay. And well, yeah. Sorry. No. Um, <laughs> speaking, speaking of uh, those international markets, very briefly, this could be a huge um, topic, but very briefly, do you have any observation on, say, APAC region shopper, European shoppers characteristics? Um, any observation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that we find with international shoppers is they're very tech savvy. Uh, mobile buying is important. So you need to make sure that whether your website is set up for that mobile transaction or maybe you've built an app for your phone, but definitely that is a huge part of it. Payments is a huge part. You know, they want to have options that are easy that they're used to in buying so definitely payments and then i would lastly say you know the customer experience is probably one of the most important parts of buying online i know that i buy online to, online today well one is i can't leave my house as often but also before that is it was about convenience it was about how mm -hmm. easy it is and so you need to make sure that your site set up for customers no matter what part of the world they're coming from uh, that you can handle them and it's a great easy buying experience for them cool cool thank you yeah absolutely and i think that's one of the reasons that the u.s is not capturing you know those global orders as well as other countries is because most of our e-commerce sites are set up for a domestic customer and you do have to make some changes for that international shopper to be able to capture that order so just an example you know when i buy today i jump onto a website it's my language it's my currency if i google something you know it pulls up us sites for me i add items to my cart I go to check out for the most part, people are doing free shipping or they're maybe doing flat rate shipping. And Amazon's kind of created little monsters in us because now, you know, I expect that package to be to my door, what, in like an hour now, maybe the next day. <laughs> and it's just, there's no surprises, right? So it's super simple uh -huh. for us. But let me walk you through what an uh, international shopper goes through. So I was talking to a lady from France and she was telling me that if she Googles in English, it'll pull up US sites for her. And one of the problems with that is a lot of times when she gets on a US website, she has no idea if that company will ship to her country. So she has to go through like shipping FAQs or she has to add items to her cart, go to checkout. And when she goes to select her country, that's where she finds out yes or no, they ship to her. So, the first thing that they have to go through is, does this, does this company even ship to my country? And it's a ton of work for them. But then, you know, the site can be in a different language. It can be a different currency. But let's say they add items to their cart. They get through the shopping experience. They go to checkout. Well, now they may hear what shipping is, but they usually hear nothing on taxes. Sometimes it'll say 0%. They most of the time have to pay in US dollars, so they have to figure out the exchange rate on it. 
when that order goes through and the package gets shipped and sent to their door, before they can receive their package, when a carrier like UPS or FedEx, any of those show up at the door, they are requesting additional fees, which are those import fees. And the customer either had no idea that they were gonna be due, or a lot of times it's much more expensive than they expected. And so now they either have to get out their card and pay again, so we're making them pay twice almost for a package, or they can refuse to pay for it, send it back, and uh, then they don't get their product either. So we make this process really difficult when we have customers who want to buy from the U.S. because of our great products and um, because of what they're going to, you know, what the U.S. is known for, they want to buy from us. For a lot of U.S. merchants, I usually hear the same thing from them, which is international is a small percentage of their business, but it's 80% of their headaches. It is very difficult to, you know, they don't have the right technologies in place. They don't have the right only, process. Only yeah. if you do it wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they can lose a lot of money, too, by having those denied packages. Fraud is definitely an issue when it comes to uh, international. And so there are some merchants here in the U.S. who have decided, you know, they don't want to do international because it's too difficult or there's all those unknowns out there, okay. which can definitely create a bad experience. So how, how is the conversion for, for cross-border shopping more, can, more complicated than domestic ones? Yeah, definitely. You know, conversion is such a big deal when we're driving customers to our websites. And domestically, you know, it's, I already talked about how great the experience is that they make it yeah. so simple, right? Like just like one click and you can almost check out. Yeah. Well, when yeah. we don't have that same process for international shoppers, you have a lot more abandoned carts. If we put too many barriers in place for them, then they're probably not going to buy from you. And so most companies will see that their conversion rate is much uh, less than what they have domestically. And brand experience is so important for a lot of companies today. And if you're not giving your international shoppers the same brand experience that you give domestically or that you're showing you know, on your social media, that also can really hurt how people see your business and want to buy from you in the future, for sure. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, so this was actually a survey done by Canada Post that talked about why shoppers abandon carts to kind of go in from that conversation. Um, and this is for international shoppers, but it talks a little bit about shipping. You know, that's a really big deal when doing international. And I'll tell you, I, I'm a small business owner myself, and to me, shipping is the, the hardest thing to set up. You know, there's so many options. I already said customers, they want it for free and they want it tomorrow, which is obviously not possible. Um, but giving options and things like that. So shipping can be really difficult because it's such a huge expectation from shoppers today. So a couple of things that they either abandon the cart is shown in, in pink or green if they'll just avoid the retailer altogether. But if you mm -hmm. don't give them a delivery date, you know, we want to know when our package is going to be there. If you call it a general shipping name compared to who it's going to be through. So there are some customers who know that like, hey, if UPS ships into my country, they're really reliable. You know, I know I'm going to get the package or if DHL, you know, whoever that carrier is. So being able to let them know who that is is important. Um, any type of delivery instructions, being able to pick it up. But one of the big things is those duties and taxes. A lot of international shoppers with it growing, um, buying from other countries, they're starting to know that, yes, we have to pay duties and taxes, those import fees. But if they don't know the amount, then mm -hmm. they're just going to abandon cart or they may never shop with that, that retailer again. So these are some of the things to think about if you're planning on, you know, opening new markets for your company as to what 
how, how are you handling that international shopper on the shipping side of things? I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what goes into a landed cost for a customer. So I've already kind of talked about like the US experience online. We mm -hmm. really have a hard time understanding duties and taxes because number one is if you ship into the US from another country, if it's under $800, we pay nothing on it. We don't pay the duties, taxes, or any fees on it, which most shipments online are under 800, not always, but so a lot of us here in the, in the US, we can't understand how much it would be to actually import a package. But this is the breakdown of an order going to uh, the EU. So duty is the That's first the complicated line complicated one. Yeah, <laughs> this makes it fun. And this is why not only online retailers can't figure it out, but, but international shoppers can't figure it out. And I'll tell you, even when I talk to custom agents, like it's not an easy answer, right? They have to do some research on how it's calculated and things like that. Uh, but anyways, the top one here is what we call duty. Now duty is based off of the product. So every product has a 10 digit code. It's called an HS code. The first six digits of that code is universal. Every country uses that first six digits. But then the last four are gonna be country specific. So every product has a different HS code. So you can imagine, you know, these companies that have 50,000 SKUs, they're gonna have 50,000 different HS codes out there. Now, with language barriers, that HS code is what the different countries are using to know what a product is. So it basically describes your product. You don't have to have an HS code to send a product cross-border. You can do an item description in place of it, but an HS code will help. It just takes out the guesswork for that customs agent. But based off that HS code, and it also will depend on the country of origin of the product and the country that it's going to, it'll have a percentage. And it'll be anywhere from probably 4% to maybe 12%, depending on the item. There are some outside of it, like if you're shipping into Mexico and the country of origin is China. Well, Mexico is trying to, you know, beat China on you know, manufacturing products. So they put a higher tax rate on it if it's country of origin of China. So those are some things that can go into play with it. Um, but that's how it's calculated for duty. Mm -hmm. And then fees below, this is a breakdown of a UPS package, but just know all of the carriers will charge different fees. And it's the carrier, let's say the package is from the US. So UPS here in the US will charge fees to push that package through customs for you. And then UPS in, will say the EU, they'll charge their fees to be able to take that package from customs for you. And so this is can be a lot of money, as you can see, of having carrier fees in this. And this is what most companies do not calculate or know what that amount is gonna be. And then the bottom part is taxes. Again, it's something that every country does a little bit different. The EU is anywhere from 20 to 25% taxes, depending on the country it's going to. Um, but like Canada will have a different tax than say the EU does. And you can see here, they also tax not only um, the items, but they'll also tax the shipping. They also tax the duties and then tax on the fees as well. So those are all things that a lot of people forget to include in that, um, you know, when they're trying to figure out that total bounded cost. Mm -hmm. So it can be overwhelming. And if, can you imagine if you've paid for a product and all of a sudden somebody showed up at your door and you owe an additional $200, a lot of people aren't gonna pay that and that's where they're really getting a terrible experience. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for, for, for uh, the, the such thorough ex explanation. So this is what your basically your software does, and mainly you can help them yes. calculate all those accurately. Because uh, as far as I know, as you said already, um, VATS in European and different country charges different number on it. So you want to give a very good accurate uh, number. 
Yeah, and we have we have a full team. We call them our global trade management team. That that is all they do every day is trying to stay up to date with all of the country laws and changes that are happening. You know, here in the U.S., we're going through our own changes, and mm -hmm. so if we have to have a whole team that does it full time, you know. This is why the expectation of if you have your own business to be able to do this yourself is almost impossible and really difficult. Okay, and uh, some of some of the uh, folks may just started looking into selling internationally. Do you have anything they can? Do you have any documents that they can read or any link they can just do some one-on-one -on -one research? Absolutely. So Zonos is a company that our goal is to educate on ways to get your package cross border or, you know, in other countries. So I think in a couple of slides, I have the URL to our docs, which cool. you can go and it'll break down a uh, landed cost for you, how it's calculated. It tells you we have country guides as well. So if you're interested in one specific country, there's some information in there compliance rules things like that so yeah we have tons of free info out there for anyone to read good and to kind of hit on that my next slide is a little bit about some of those compliance issues that some people have to be aware of um, and i won't spend a ton of time on this like i say there are documentation for all of these but uh, that first one is a denied party list so here in the u.s it's put out by the state department there's a a list of individuals, uh, email addresses, addresses that we cannot export items to. It's someone that we've recognized as maybe like they're a terrorist or you know some big reason why you're not allowed to export them. So that's one thing to be aware of when you're doing international is making sure that you're checking that list that you're not shipping to someone you're not supposed to be. Um, the EU came out with what they call GDPR, and it's basically their Privacy Act, where there's a lot that goes into it, but one that sticks out for me on online orders is if somebody gives you an email address here in the U.S. and we place an order, that's us telling that company that they can you know, email us on order confirmations and shipping confirmations. Well, in the EU, you actually have to get the customer's approval to even send those order confirmations. So it's something that you want to be aware, with, aware of when looking at the EU and GDPR. Um, there are, yeah, and I think more countries are going to start adding things in like GDPR in there. Um, restricted items. So not every country will take every item and you want to know what your restrictions are. Uh, one small one I heard of the other day is you actually cannot send anything camouflage into Barbados. I'm not sure why, but that's something that if you have your products, you may want to, and there's a couple of websites, by the way, like I know UPS or FedEx on their website, they have some restricted um, guides for you, but you can go and check like, hey, is there anything odd about my product that can't go into a specific country and knowing what those restrictions look like. And then for most countries that you're shipping into, the duties and taxes that I talk about, it's up to the importer to pay those duties and taxes for the most part. There are a couple of countries though that have come out with some new laws that you'll want to be aware of. So I've added Australia because that's probably the most popular. If you ship into Australia over 75,000 Australian dollars, which is about 56,000 USD, uh, then you actually have to register with the Australian government and pay taxes to the Australian government. So it's only if you go over that threshold within a 12 month rolling period, but you'll wanna make sure if you know your sales into Australia that you start collecting that from your shoppers. And then Norway is another country that does it, and then also New Zealand as well. So these are just a couple of uh, small compliance things that going international you'll want to know to make sure that you protect yourself and your business. I uh, talked about the guides. This is our website. So it's just docs.zonos.com forward slash guides. And we have tons of information in there about you know, things to know uh, when going international, for sure. Cool. I uh, 
think this is uh, close to my last slide, but I really just wanted to talk a little bit about one of our Zonos products. If you're new to international and you're wanting to get started, we have what we call Zonos Hello. It's an example here on the right hand side. Um, Zonos Hello is a free product that we offer. It can go on any website, so it doesn't matter who your platform is, but it's IP recognition software. So when an international shopper gets onto your website, it would recognize that they're from Canada and it basically welcomes them. It lets them know right away that you do international, which as I talked about earlier with uh, that lady from France, that was her biggest um, issue that she was running into is she didn't know, you know, she had to research if a company would ship to their country. So this is a way for you to let your customers know right away, yes, you know, we can ship to your country, we handle your order. It also tells them a little bit about duties and taxes so that it can start preparing them for, you know, on average, your tax rate is going to be this, um, depending on the country they're coming from. So if That's you, wonderful. yeah, it's a great product. Uh, if you're interested, you just go to hello.zonos.com, um, enter in your URL and email address, and then we'll send you back the code. It's JavaScript. So it's really easy to put onto any site. And it is free, you said? Uh-huh. OK. Yep. It's completely free. You don't have to sign up an account with Sonos or anything like that. Wonderful. So just to kind of close up for, uh, you know, for my part with Sonos, if you're thinking about doing international, I definitely recommend looking at your website to see where visitors are coming from. Pick maybe your top five countries and, you know, start open it up on your website, start talking um, to those types of customers through your social media and get with a shipping partner because that's definitely going to be a huge part of going international. But I don't want anyone to think this is too overwhelming because I think that's how a lot of people see international. So if you've ever even had a thought that you should consider it, the answer is yes. You should just get started and see that it's actually easier than you think. And once you get started, you'll start to see what your customers, what's important to your customers, a way to customize to make sure that they have a better, better experience. So uh, that also start, my, yeah. Um, uh, qu a question on um, to, what's the good sign? I mean, if I, you know, I got some organic visitors, shoppers here and there from some countries outside of the US, is that a good sign for you to, hey, you need to look into that? Yes, and it doesn't have to be a ton of customers. I, I look at websites all day long, and I'll tell you, if it's over 5% of your visitors are coming from other countries, you should have something on your website that is for those international shoppers. And uh, okay. a lot of US companies start with English speaking, like Canada, because they're so close. Uh, Australia is a good one too. But if you're not having visitors from those countries, it's probably not one I would focus on. So depending on where your, your visitors are coming from, and Google Analytics should be able to share that with you. OK. So there's a question, live question. For someone looking to go international, what countries do merchants generally start with? I guess yeah. what kind of cover, yeah. Kind of hit on that. Uh, definitely English speaking art are easier to start with uh, just because you don't have to worry about the language barrier in there. Um, but definitely, like I say, look at your analytics. Also, a lot of times when you are having customers visit your site, they may be using a contact form if they can't complete a purchase. So if you're getting interaction through your contact form or through your social media from customers in other countries, that's another good sign that that would be a good country to go into. Okay, and what are other approaches to do research? Because if somebody want to do this systematically, they want to do some research to, to have a better understanding about the international markets, uh, the potential there for their product. What are the methods, approaches do you recommend people to do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I already mentioned a little bit about our docs. I do recommend going on there and learning about specific countries. Um, the carriers also have a, 
a lot of really great information about restricted items into certain countries, things like that, social media. I'm going to tell this one story because I hear all the time like, hey, maybe, you know, why would anyone want my product in another country? But I was on a call with a lady from Brazil, and this was actually a couple of years ago, but it's really stuck with me. But she was telling me, well, I think I asked her, why do you buy from other countries? Because the duties and taxes going into Brazil are outrageous. Most of the time people pay more for duties and taxes than they do for the product themselves. So I said, you know, why, why do you buy from other countries? And she told me a story about she actually bought a refrigerator from the U.S. And you can imagine how expensive it was to ship a refrigerator and what those duties and taxes yeah. are on that. Uh, but she was telling me that the refrigerator she got, she ended up paying $7,500 buying it from the U.S. But if she would have gotten that same thing in her own country, it would have been closer to 15000 So it does definitely pay off to look at the buying um, experience and the market for your product in other countries. And if there's a need, then maybe it makes sense for it. Okay. And um, would it be worth looking to your Google Analytics to see where's your traffic coming from? There is there any traffic coming from overseas and all that? Yeah, is it coming from other countries? I would also look at, you know, how long are they on your site for? Do you have okay. some countries that maybe spend more time looking at your products, things like that? Oh, okay, that's helpful. So, um, so thank you, Tony. That's that's very very uh, insightful, and I thank you for your expertise. So let's hand it over to Denise. So we all know that e-commerce has increased since the pandemic overall, and um, that's been great for anybody that's in e-commerce, obviously. And it's not just domestic, it's also cross-border purchases. This chart shows U.S. cross-border sales growth spiked dramatically in May, and it was up 42% compared to May of 2019. Globally, digital commerce puts cross-border e-commerce growth at 21% from January to just July this year. So there's definitely an opportunity out there to capture some of that. Cross-border e-commerce is one way merchants can grow and protect themselves from downturns and recessions in their home markets as well. For example, China's luxury market started to rebound earlier than other places because coronavirus hit there earlier and China was among one of the first countries to restart their economy. Not only all e-commerce markets have lots of mature local merchants, so online shoppers are used to and they're comfortable with making cross-border purchases. Tawny shared a couple of those examples, but another one would be in Mexico. Half the top 10 e-commerce sites are based in the U.S. and the number one site there is based actually in Argentina. So just like selling domestically, cross-border transactions run the risk of fraud and chargebacks. Merchants who don't have resources to screen those orders sometimes resort to writing off entire markets, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But for merchants okay. who do take cross-border orders, it's important to balance the fraud risks with the risks of turning away revenue and to understand how declining orders can damage your brand. Did you have something, William? Yeah, so Denise, so what's the difference between chargebacks and uh, false declines? We're going to go into that a little bit more, but in, in okay. basic sense, chargebacks or something that occurs after a sale because it was a fraudulent purchase that the consumer would then turn in and, and say that they never ordered. Uh, a false decline would be an order that never happened because for whatever reason, that, that customer was stopped from making that purchase, but they were actually a good customer. Okay. So most of the time we think about chargeback costs as the cost of the chargeback fee itself, which can be anywhere from 20 to $100. Um, keeping in mind that this adds up quickly. If your store is hit by a wave of fraud, some of you may have experienced that, unfortunately. We talk to merchants all the time where that happens and they're in panic mode. Even if the chargeback is resolved in your favor and you recover that lost revenue, there are no refunds on the chargeback fee. So you're ending up paying that out of pocket anyway. But the costs are not just those relating to the chargeback itself. You're still paying your processor the wholesale cost of the transaction plus their markup. And if your chargeback ratio gets too high, 
you might get labeled as high risk and processing fees are going to go up for all of your transactions moving forward. And if it continues to stay in um, high ranges, which would be 0.9% or higher, it could even be lower uh, where you start to get those additional costs. But um, you might lose your merchant account overall if you don't keep those in check. You could also lose the cost of goods that were stolen, the time and the money your business invested in acquiring, storing, marketing, fulfilling and shipping those goods, and the money you spent on fraud protection, whether it's internal or externally sourced co costs that didn't protect you from your chargebacks overall. And that's why the real cost of fraud is more than the value of the fraudulent transaction. Your actual losses will depend on your expenses on marketing and inventory, et cetera, like we talked about. LexisNexis publishes its true cost of fraud study. And in July of this year, they found that for each dollar of fraud, merchants lose an average of $3.36. And that number has been increasing each year since at least 2016. So fraud is taking a growing portion of merchants' revenue. According to LexisNexis, U.S. e-commerce merchants are using mobile channel, who are using mobile channels are seeing more cross-border fraud losses this year as well. This type of fraud was trending upward before the pandemic. Researchers are seeing a lot of botnet fraud by organized criminals in cross-border mobile commerce. And they do this by linking multiple devices and they can obscure the origin of the order and the payment source. So chargebacks are a real concern in cross-border e-commerce, but false declines have an impact as well. So let's look at false declines, which is something that not all of our merchants um, take into consideration when we first start talking to them but you definitely should be focusing in on this piece. It's, it's super important. Not all rejected orders are fraud. And when you decline an order in error, you lose the profit on that good order. Should you care? Because after all, you're going to lose $3.36 for every dollar of fraud. And so it seems wise to be as strict as possible. But if false declines can cost your business even more, perhaps that's not the case. When you decline a good order, you may never see that customer again. Clear Sale commissioned a study from Sapio Research um, earlier this year, and they found a third of online shoppers will abandon a merchant after a decline. So that false decline hits them hard. It raises your cost to acquire customers and reduces your average lifetime value. So the marketing spend that gets them to your store is often wasted after a false decline. And a quarter of declined shoppers are likely to say something about it on social media. So that can make it harder and more expensive to attract replacement customers. That's not good. Nope, not at all. False declines can make your fraud protection less effective over time too. So if you automatically reject suspect orders and you're using AI so your system learns which orders are likely to be fraud, Every false decline looks like real fraud to your AI, so the system will reject more good orders over time. So it's actually doing the wrong thing. We asked Sapio Research to survey consumers in several major markets, and this is what they found. In APAC, 38% of Australian shoppers say that they won't shop again with a merchant after a false decline. In Latin America, 51% of Mexican shoppers say that they won't shop again with a merchant after a false decline. And for comparison, we already talked about the 33% in the US. So in all countries, consumers are more tolerant of stores where they have a fraud experience than stores that reject their orders in error. In APAC, 22% of Australian consumers are likely to say something negative on social media in Latin America, 39% of Mexican consumers say the same, and as we talked about, 25% in the U.S. That's a lot of people talking bad things. <laughs> mm -hmm. How common are those false declines? Um, the Merchant Resource Council's 2019 Global Fraud Survey found that small online shoppers decline an average of 4.5% of their domestic orders. So how many of these are really good? Some studies put that figure at 30%, but at clear sale, we find that for most of our merchants, it's closer to 65%. 
Because of their long-term customer value erosion and marketing waste that false declines cause, it can take 12 or more good orders to make up for the costs related to one false decline. That's why I said it was important. <laughs> it truly is. Yeah, that's a really high number. That's really uh, it is surprising. So do you know your chargeback and false decline rates? It's, um, it's a metric or a KPI that you should be monitoring on a month-to-month -month basis. And let me show you how to find them. So data about your chargeback should be easy to find. Your chargeback ratio is the number of chargebacks in a given month, and you divide that by the total order of numbers in that same month. And then, of course, your estimated total cost of fraud is that $3.36 times the dollar amount of your fraudulent orders. For your false decline rate, you can audit your rejected orders to see which ones were actually good. Or if you don't have the time or the expertise to do that and dig in on that, you can just take our rate of 65% times your number of rejected orders and easily come up with that number. So let's review the potential strategies that merchants use in their, in their outcomes. Um, we sometimes see merchants who are so worried about cross-border fraud that they just don't take cross-border orders at all. They reject them all. So they're turning away all that possible revenue and they're sending customers away and many are not going to come back. They're also risking brand damage on social media when re the reject rejected customers complain. Some merchants are a little bit bolder and they'll accept cross-border orders from countries they perceive as safe while rejecting orders from so-called the riskiest countries. But again, you have the problems of lost revenue and brand damage in all the markets where you automatically reject good customers. Denise, uh, do you have any data that could tell us what the countries are, uh, what the countries that have highest fraud yeah, you could slice it and dice it a lot of different ways, but um, mm -hmm. one of the lists that I came up um, and, and based on our research as well is just the percentage of orders that are fraudulent. And the short list would be Romania, Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, Venezuela, and Indonesia. Um, you've got numbers like in Brazil, three to six fraud transactions happen every single minute in that country. In mm -hmm. Venezuela, one of the highest percentages, it's 33% of all online transactions are fraudulent. And in Indonesia, it's about 35% of all online transactions are fraudulent. The Brazil and Indonesia seem like a huge country, huge economy there. And they are. How yeah, so what's your what's your advice? I mean, um, you know, Tony, you can you, you can touch on that on this if you want. If my product just happened to be popular over there, uh, mm -hmm. did, you know, there's any way around? Absolutely. I mean, Brazil is the third largest e-commerce economy in the world. And so there is definitely opportunity there. So it's, it's a matter of weighing and balancing the risk to the reward. We work with about 90% of all the e-commerce brands in Brazil. And um, obviously some of them are very, very successful. So they're, again, it's balancing the risk and reward and making sure that you are um, putting the precautions in place and have the, the API, or not only the AI in place, but the fraud screening capabilities to make sure that you've got um, the, the armor to protect yourself. Okay. So back to the strategy when we're talking about they're going to go for it, right? So this kind of goes along with, okay, there's, there's opportunity there. I'm going to go for it because I want my brand revenue to grow and I want to grow my sales overall. But without fraud controls and um, that are tailored to each market profile and consumer habits, two things can go wrong. Fraud can slip through the cracks leading to chargebacks. And if you're automatically rejecting flagged orders, they may be a, there may be a lot in your system doesn't understand in the local market if you're still losing revenue and creating a brand reputation problem there too. So none of those scenarios are really the way to go. So the most effective strategy, to get back to your point here, William, is to mm -hmm. um, accept cross-border orders with fraud prevention system that understands how consumers and fraudsters act in every region and manually review every flagged order. 
So if you're not able to do that yourself, find a system that can do that for you. The results so of this strategy are more revenue from the global customers, a stronger brand reputation, and ultimately less fraud overall. So your system has this menu review process built in? Absolutely. We have machine learning and manual review, so it gets smarter okay. over time because the, our review team will teach it about the flagged orders and which ones are actually good orders, and that lets your store prove those good orders faster as time goes on rather than rejecting them. And how is compare compared to those solutions that only use AI to, to detect? And yeah, to go back to that point, the AI is only um, as effective as, as, as the false declines come in. They're going to get more and they're going to increase over time because you're not feeding that loop back in with that human intervention. So it's telling your system, oh, that's, that's a, fraud, or a, a bad order. And it's declining it falsely when, when that really is a good customer. So it gets worse over time. Okay. So the busiest online sales day in Mexico, I know Tani mentioned a couple of, of busy days to benchmark as well, but um, the busiest one in Mexico traditionally had been Black Friday. But in 2011, the Council of Business Coordination created El Buen Fin, the good weekend which occurs the third weekend of November, so coming right up, and it offers another popular shopping weekend with special promotions. Our merchants in Mexico have seen huge growth year over year here. So Mexico is a growing market for e-commerce, and it's definitely had its own fraud challenges. I mean, we mentioned it on that list of, of most uh, risky countries. 50% false decline rates are not uncommon among Mexican e-commerce merchants. So if you think about in the US, false decline rates being way lower than that, 50% is not uncommon. The chargeback rate in Mexico is three times higher than the global average, and 56% of Mexican credit card holders have been victims of fraud. Motorola, one of our partners, knew their risks were even higher since their products are highly targeted by fraudsters due to the strong brand recognition, the small size of the product, the high resale value, and the big profit margin. So it's almost the perfect storm for fraud. To make matters worse, order volume typically grew tenfold during this peak sales time, which made it nearly impossible to keep pace with accurate screening and flagging suspicious transactions. So Motorola partnered with ClearSale in September of 2019 to screen its Mexican e-commerce orders. We used advanced machine learning to screen every order and flag suspicious activity. And then we reviewed each flag transaction manually, as we mentioned, establishing contact with buyers as needed to verify transactions. We provide Motorola with detailed real-time reporting on orders, approval rates, chargeback rates, so that they can monitor their KPIs. And we offered round-the-clock support that reassured Motorola that they would have a trusted partner in fraud management. And at the end, we covered 100% of all fraud-related chargebacks and compensated, the, compensated them in full if they would occur. So I'm happy to report the findings over time. Within just three months of working with ClearSale, including during the peak sales days of Black Friday and Buen Fin, the improvement in the chargeback rate came at no extra cost to Motorola. The entire updated fraud management strategy ensured Motorola was able to quickly approve transactions with greater confidence than ever before, all while delivering that great customer, um, seamless um, customer experience that Tony was talking about as well. Wonderful. Um, a question on um, if um, a merchant is using some payment company that has uh, installed some fraud screening, do they kind of still need to have a, a fraud detection software like, like you. Yeah, so on the payment option itself, if it's got fraud screening, like some basic rules in place. Mm -hmm. We work with a lot of merchants that um, deploy clear sale as well. And the reason why is because on the rules-based system, as we talked about, it's, it's just not enough. Um, we would never decline an order based on the um, machine or the AI alone we actually always inject that human intervention and nobody else does that. Um, so if we're, you're going to get the best results possible, you have to add that extra layer of human intervention. Okay. 
And uh, do you see certain category of merchandise are more prone to fraud than others? Yeah, it used to be, um, you know, the obvious ones were like Motorola, the, the consumer electronics with the brand name. Um, luxury goods are targeted quite often, um, jewelry being one of those as well. But we're starting to see more and more fraud happening across different verticals, across um, different countries. Um, it's kind of, I mentioned the perfect storm for fraud. Right now it really is because you've got a lot of people that are out of work and they're desperate for money. So more fraudsters mm -hmm. are emerging. You've got okay. more phishing sites. The latest report I saw is that they were up 65% this year. So that means there's more stolen credit cards to utilize. And fraudsters might not be targeting um, fraud on your particular site just to obtain the product. They might be testing cards. So if you're seeing, you say, oh, well, I'm a merchant and I don't really have a fraud um, target uh, product. It's $25 t-shirts but you're starting to see some chargebacks come through $25 at a time. That could be fraudsters just checking um, out your site to see if they can check cards to sell them on the black market um, when they're valid. And so you can become a victim of that as well and obtain chargebacks and everything else around that that goes with that. So a lot of different mm -hmm. aspects to consider. Gotcha. Um, go back to Tony. Um, if, if some merchant, they, uh, they, their merchandise is kind of a low value, you know, on big in size. Is, does that really put them in a disadvantaged position when it comes to cross-border e-commerce? Yeah, I think you have to look at it as you do domestically, right? Because even if you have those low value, uh, large orders, your shipping costs do matter, absolutely. But if there's a need for your product in other countries, then I still think you'll be successful. And if you still set up the experience for the customer, you can still be successful. I mean, the refrigerator is a great story of something large that you would think, you know, who would ship that? But apparently it, it works. Uh, we also okay. work with a lot of, <laughs> yeah, we work with a lot of part companies where like they have a really low order value and people are paying more for shipping and duties and taxes but they can't get that product anywhere else. And so it makes sense mm -hmm. for him. So I think it's I did more that about your product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Um, okay, one last question. Um, after COVID, I mean, probably this is no way to ac actually predict, but uh, I mean, after the COVID, do you guys want to take a guess which country, what markets would rebound very, very um, um, quickly? So, you know, we got opportunity to go in. Yeah, I think with COVID, one of the things that it has made businesses realize is number one, you have to be online, right, to survive. So I think the number one thing is getting out there and definitely opening up any new market because, mm -hmm. you know, when the, if the U.S. shuts down, if you have, if you're still able to ship to other countries, you know, at least being there and having your stuff um, out there. And it's also taught us as buyers. So some people who maybe haven't bought online before, which my dad is a great example. Uh, mm -hmm. He's in his later 60s and he, you know, has never done online. Well, it kind of forced him to, he had to learn to do it. And so that's why I think we've seen such a, a growth in e-commerce. But I would say a lot of countries that are coming up in international or cross-border. Definitely the EU is a huge um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, India, I've have had a lot of success with. Um, some of these other countries, for sure, uh, you know, like China, Singapore is a great one as well. So I think, honestly, all those countries are valid opportunities. It's just mm -hmm. finding the one that's going to be a fit for your product. Okay. Absolutely. I wish we had a crystal ball and we knew post COVID. <laughs> so it would put us up. But I think that um, to, mm -hmm. to Tony's point, there are more first time buyers all the time, which makes them riskier buyers because there is no profile. But it also has created um, a, a new emergence of, of customer expectations. And I think as merchants, we all have to consider that as well because the lines are blurred now between whether you, how you're buying and that contact, contactless buying experience, 
whether it's picking up food from a restaurant or picking up groceries, all of these sorts of things start to really, I think, push the boundaries of e-commerce and provide additional mm-hmm. opportunities. Um, and, and it creates less boundaries, in fact, as far as where your audience is going to be. So um, as merchants, just be aware of that and be willing to move and improve and do what is needed to support the people that want to buy from you and, and allow them to do it quickly with a great customer experience. Okay, that's wonderful. All right, thank you, uh, Denise and Tani, again for your participation and expertise. And I enjoyed it very much, and I hope you enjoyed it very as well. And the folks will see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.